Hi everyone. I wanted to spend a few minutes talking with you about the subject of schizophrenia. And the reason why is because schizophrenia is considered by many to be a classic example of what we mean when we talk of, when we speak of, a mental illness or a mental disorder. Whenever we think of someone having a mental disorder, one of the pictures that might come into our minds is of something that meets the diagnostic criteria of schizophrenia. And what schizophrenia is, is a type of disorder which we would classify as psychosis. Psychosis means simply that someone is out of touch with reality. They are not interpreting things. They are not seeing things the way that most people around them are seeing things. So psychosis is a break with reality. Schizophrenia itself has specific diagnostic elements, which we'll look at in a second. I wanted to take a moment, though, to talk about the term schizophrenia. When the diagnosis was originally developed, the word that was developed for it, or put with the diagnostic criteria, was premature dementia. The psychiatrist Emil Kraepelin was the one who developed that term. And the reason he called it premature dementia was because he was seeing people who were in their late teens and early 20s who seemed to have, in his opinion, mental deterioration of the kind that you would perhaps only see in individuals who were older, in their 70s or 80s, the type of dementia we now know as Alzheimer's disease. So he called it premature dementia. Eugen Bleuler, Eugene Bleuler, a uh, different way to pronounce his name, came up with the term schizophrenia, and that's derived from two Greek words, schizo, or schizo, meaning split, and phrenology, or phreno, meaning mind. So literally the term schizophrenia means split mind. But it's not the same thing as something like multiple personality disorder. Because what Bleuler actually meant when he said split mind was a distinction between, or a split, between the emotions and the rational mind of the individual. So you could have someone who would sit in front of you and talk about something completely horrific, but have a smile on their face, or have a completely neutral expression. So their emotions were split, cut off from their rational mind, from the, the meaning of what they were saying. And when we think of it that way, it makes more sense. If we just say split mind, it conjures up notions of perhaps Norman Bates from the movie Psycho, where he's both Norman and his mother. So it's that's not what it means. It means a split between reason and emotions. But again, schizophrenia is a type of psychosis. There is a break with reality. And this is perhaps most clearly manifest in one of the one of the diagnostic criteria, which is hallucinations. Now what it means to hallucinate is that you're seeing something that isn't there or you're hearing something that is not there. And the most common type of hallucination for individuals with schizophrenia is an auditory hallucination. They hear things that are not there. Well, they're not there in the external environment. There's nobody actually saying something to them, but they what they hear is interpreted as coming from outside of themselves. Now think about this for a moment. We all hear things. We all hear voices inside of our head. You might think to yourself for a moment, oh, Dr. Hastert, I don't hear voices inside my head. Well, do you ever have a song that starts playing uh, and you can't get it out of your head? Do you ever say things to yourself like, boy, that was a stupid thing that I just did. Oh, I wish I hadn't have said that. Things like that. But you know where that information is coming from. It's coming from you. It's not coming from some other place. But the individual with schizophrenia 
might often interpret that inner voice or songs or noises or sounds that would come into our heads and we go, my gosh, I just can't get that, that thought out of my head, that sound out of my head. But the individual with schizophrenia will interpret that thought as being implanted into their head or as the voice from as coming from outside of themselves or maybe from inside of themselves, but it's because the CIA or the KGB or the FBI implanted something in their head to make them hear that. So that would be a hallucination, hearing things that aren't there, seeing things that aren't there. Those are hallucinations. Again, auditory hallucinations are the most common form, but there are also visual hallucinations, uh, somatic hallucinations, and, uh, and uh, sometimes olfactory hallucinations. They will smell things that no one else can smell. So that's one element of it. Another diagnostic element is a delusion or having various delusions. One classic type of delusion is known as a delusion of grandeur. Uh, believing that you're Napoleon, or Jesus, or the President, or some other important figure. Uh, one of the other types of delusions are paranoid delusions. So somebody might be convinced that they are being followed, or that everyone is out to get them, everyone is conspiring against them. That would be a, a paranoid delusion. and. Uh, there were old subtypes of schizophrenia, and one of the most commonly diagnosed was paranoid schizophrenia. There's also other elements to the diagnosis that I want to share with you. Uh, one is disorganized speech. The individual with schizophrenia might start talking, and from a distance it would sound like they're saying something coherent, but if you listen to what they're saying, it makes no sense. One sentence will jump off in midstream onto something else. They might be talking about the weather, but then they might get focused in on something that they just said about the clouds, and then the clouds will go into a discussion of things that are soft, like cotton balls, and then uh, the discussion about cotton balls might go into something else. And there I'm trying to paint a linear picture or a picture that kind of makes sense as to what they're saying. And it, and it might, if you were to trace things Exactly. You might see how one thing actually links to another, but if you're, if you're actually in a conversation with such an individual, it might be exhausting because it's too hard to follow their train of thought because their train of thought is marked by what we would call loose associations. The associations go all over the place. So disorganized speech is one element. Another element is negative symptomology or negative symptoms. Now, when we talk about a positive symptom, we're talking about something like hallucination, something that most of us don't have that's added to normal thought or behavior. So that's a positive. When we talk in psychology about positive reinforcement, it means adding something. Uh, and with a positive symptom, it's adding something that shouldn't be there. With a negative uh, symptom, it's taking something away that should be there. So. Uh, a negative symptom might be something like a lack of emotion. Most people, when they talk, have some emotional content to what they're saying. Their voice goes up, it goes down, their facial expressions change, but an individual with schizophrenia might have blunted affect or uh, decreased affect. Again, they might be saying something that sounds very emotional, but there's actually no emotional tone when they're conveying it to you. They also might not move around all that much. They might not. Uh, they might not speak that much. So, decreases in speech, decreases in behavior, decreases in emotions. Those would be considered uh, negative symptoms. So you have some negative symptoms in schizophrenia, and you have some positive symptoms. Now, going back to the disorganized speech for a second. When you hear someone speak in such a disorganized or loosely uh, fashioned way that everything seems to be associated with someone else, you can usually get an idea that there's something that underlies that in their general thought process, that there's something qu not quite right in the way they're thinking about things. 
And for that reason, schizophrenia is often called a thought disorder, that there is something wrong, pathological, or abnormal about the individual's thoughts. When I talk about this, I'll often ask students to reflect on instances when they have had hallucinations. And most of us will say, well, I've never hallucinated. But think about when you fall asleep and when you have dreams during REM sleep. Those are hallucinations. You are experiencing things that aren't there. You are hearing voices that are generated by your own mind, and yet in the dream you interpret them as coming from outside of yourself. But when you wake up, or sometimes in the middle of a dream, you realize you're dreaming. You're not responding to things in the real world that are being presented to you in the dream. So hallucinations and delusions when you're dreaming are considered perfectly normal. However, hallucinations and delusions when you're awake are not. Sometimes when we fall asleep, we maybe hear voices that aren't there. Uh, when we're in that twilight zone uh, between falling asleep and, and uh, let's say, waking up, or between being awake and falling asleep. And those things are considered normal. Again, the individual with schizophrenia has those things, but they are so pronounced that they take over that individual's understanding of the world around them. And again, going back to one of the key elements mentioned earlier on in the course, I want you to kind of grasp or try and grasp the experience of what it would be like to have these sorts of problems. Uh, because we all have elements of these disorders, as we've talked about, but they are usually within the range of normal. So our hallucinations when we're falling asleep or when we are asleep, our uh, delusions when we're dreaming, those are perfectly normal. They don't affect our dealings with other people, usually in our waking life. And we've also probably been paranoid. How many of us haven't uh, thought that the way something was said to us, uh, the tone of voice that someone used, that there wasn't some deeper meaning there? We wonder, gosh, what did they mean by that? Maybe we even worry about how something is said to us. Uh, so we can get paranoid from time to time. I, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'll admit that. But again, that paranoia does not take over our lives. It does not become a key element about how we look at the world. So when you reflect on this chapter and on the, the concept of psychosis, I want you to try and maybe understand what this experience would be like, but also keep in mind the, the distinction as to why you are considered normal, even though you have these elements in your mental experience, and someone else is considered abnormal or perhaps pathological because they have these elements to such a degree that it impacts their life in a very negative way. Thanks.